For six centuries, the Roman Empire bends the ancient world to its will. By the fourth decade AD, it stretches from the sands of Arabia to the rocky coast of the North Sea. In every corner, it seduces its enemies with trade and luxury, all backed by the iron fist of the most disciplined army ever known to man. The Romans like to think of themselves as bringing civilization to other places. They were proud of the fact that they were governing well. They believed that Jupiter gave them this power. Governing is their, their real strength. Romans believe that this godly power is vested in the emperor, but not all emperors are divine. In 41 AD, the excesses of Emperor Caligula shake Rome to its core. Caligula was a spoiled brat. Uh, he may also have had mental illness. We hear the stories about his naming his horse a consul, for example. Uh, he, he builds bridges just so he can ride his chariot across them. I mean, he does these bizarre things and just to, to have power, to show that he has power. Significant numbers of those people very close to him began to feel that they were just in danger, that the emperor was too unstable, too paranoid, and probably just plain too crazy. Members of the elite militia, known as the Praetorian Guard, decide that Caligula must go before he turns on them. They make their move as the emperor returns from an afternoon of gambling. <laughs> First century biographer Suetonius. Caligula lay writhing on the ground. I am still alive, he shouted. But word went round, strike again, and he succumbed to 30 further wounds. It was a really crucial moment that revealed the military underpinnings of an emperor's power for the first time in a very raw and obvious fashion. The Praetorians will choose their own man as the new emperor. Behind a curtain, they find their candidate cowering, Caligula's uncle, Claudius. Here is someone who will be easy to control, a puppet to be manipulated. He drooled, he stammered, he twitched. Perhaps the only reason he survived was simply because nobody took him seriously. Nobody saw him as a possible candidate. Confident in their choice, the guard proclaims Claudius, leader of the greatest empire on earth. The senior members of his household when he was growing up had chosen not to give him significant administrative or military experience. Almost all other young men in the imperial house were thrust very rapidly into public positions. None of this happened to Claudius. Emperor Claudius has a lot to prove to his subjects who think he's incompetent. And to the Praetorians who have made him emperor, he owes a great debt. One event will serve both needs, a war. Honor and booty for the soldiers, prestige and dignity for the victorious emperor. An active conquest of some area an active military adventure will always be preferred economically for the Roman soldier. Psychologically, soldiers don't want to be inactive. Psychologically, they want to go out and fight their best. The more spectacular the conquest, the better. But where to go? Emperor Claudius's answer is as daring as it is unexpected. Britannia. The fierce and remote island that defeated Julius Caesar nearly a hundred years earlier. The man who tames it will be greater than Caesar himself. To lead the expedition, Claudius chooses Plautius, a distinguished senator and well-established commander. He leads four legions into a strange land, haunted with a dangerous history. The troops are edgy and afraid. This kind of fear of the unknown, I think, cannot be uh, minimalized in this type of an engagement. There was this real fear that maybe some first century weapon of mass destruction was going to be on the other side of the channel. 
Dark rumors fly about the fearsome magic of the Druids, the priests of Britannia's pervasive and secretive religion. Classical sage Pliny the Elder. Britannia is fascinated by magic. The monstrous Druid cult professes that to murder a man is an act of the greatest devoutness and to eat his flesh most beneficial. Evidence of human sacrifice fills the soldiers with disgust and leads Emperor Claudius to ban Druidism. For any religious cult to be suppressed, they had to be doing things that the Romans didn't like. Uh, one of those things would be human sacrifice, which the Druids are accused of doing and they may well have been involved in. Another thing would be uh, being some kind of a political or socially destabilizing uh, force. Politics and magic, a deadly combination. Cautiously, the Romans marched from their beachhead at Rutupii, present-day Richborough, towards the Thames, the river which borders the extensive lands of the powerful Catabolani tribe. Steeped in druidic mysteries, Caraticus, prince of the Catabolani people, wears no armor. He relies instead on the strong magic of his war paint. It apparently took a lot of education for druids to be able to master these things, maybe up to 20 years of learning to pick up the various texts, the poems, the chants, the, the words of prayer, uh, the magic. The Druid priests are ringleaders of rebellion against the Romans. They pass freely from one tribe to the next, spreading intelligence of the enemy and gathering new recruits. Druids are not only middlemen between the people and the gods, but as judges, as leaders, they were individuals to be reckoned with. In virtually every area of Celtic society, the Druids uh, have a stake, have, have power. Toga Dumnus, brother of Caraticus and warlord of the neighboring kingdom, arrives with his own soldiers to bolster the resistance. Their forces combined, the princes face the Romans with supreme confidence. The British hadn't been conquered the last time the Romans had come over. And of course, they were fighting on their home turf and knew the territory, and uh, they had had some experience of observing the Romans in action. So for all these reasons, they may have felt some confidence in, in, in being able to destroy the Roman forces when they arrived. Wales had the harshest of terrain, and it also had the fewest people. But there were people who were more warlike than some of the others. What the soldiers were being trained to do was to fight in long legion formations and to have the auxiliary troops on the sides to be able to operate out in the open. And this worked. It worked in North Africa, it worked in the Middle East, it worked in Gaul. It worked less well in Germany, and it certainly didn't work at all in, in Britain. Third century historian, Dio. The barbarians took refuge in the swamps and the forests, hoping to wear out the invaders in fruitless effort. They knew where the firm ground and the easy passages in this region were to be found. The Roman attempts to follow them were not so successful. If you're fighting the Romans, it seems to me that the initial British strategy was really, was, was really quite a good one. They allowed the Romans to land unopposed, and I guess the plan was to draw them in and then take them out when they were trapped inland, further inland, and they, and they couldn't escape. When the British strike, it is with guile and savagery. The discipline of Roman soldiers is well known and well documented. The fact that Roman soldiers can stay disciplined even in the midst of the worst battles is remarkable and certainly denotes a, a military skill of leadership and of training uh, that establishes the Roman soldier as the finest soldier on earth at that time, perhaps in all of history. In one skirmish after another, Claudius suffers humiliating defeats, but he remains undaunted. 
The Roman army, above all, was patient. There's no question the decisive victory here. This was going to be a campaign, and the campaign was going to take long. After all, where did the Romans have to go? Back in Rome, Emperor Claudius preens and prepares for his own invasion of Britain. Soon he will personally see to her surrender. For the first time in his life, he tries on the garb of a warrior. He needed to establish his military credentials. This is, was an essential part of being in the public eye in, in ancient Rome, was to be militarily efficient and to have some achievement under your belt, preferably victory over some foreign enemy. Claudius plans to overwhelm the barbarians with the most destructive and imposing weapon of the classical world, battle elephants. They will announce the grand entrance of the emperor. Then Claudius will teach the Britons to grovel before the almighty Roman Empire and claim a piece of glory for himself. In 43 AD, Emperor Claudius prepares to conquer the fabled island of Britannia. He sends his seasoned general Plautius and four legions to clear his way. At first, the Romans are outfoxed by the Druids, lured ever deeper into unfriendly territory. But now, Plautius sees an opportunity to turn the tables. He orders a special force of provincials to launch a sneak attack across the River Thames. The Roman army was composed of more or less two kinds of soldiers, those whom they called legionaries, who were Roman citizens, and those whom they called auxiliaries, who were recruited from subject populations. So Plautius has these auxiliaries swim across the, the Thames, not because the Roman soldiers couldn't have swum across the Thames. It's just if it's more dangerous, if there's the potential of uh, losing a large number of regular troops, why not let the auxiliaries do it? Like all Druids, the warlords Caraticus and Togadumnus hold water sacred believing the mighty river protects them from their enemies. Not burdened by this belief, the Roman auxiliaries cross silently and unseen. They prove to be very good at discerning what types of armies they were facing, how unified those types of armies they were facing, what their arms and armor were. So they operate as scouts and seem to understand a little bit better who they were encountering and what the numbers were. Having learned what they need to, the auxiliaries kill the barbarian horses, cutting off any possibility of a fast retreat. Only now does Plautius send in his full force to attack the Catavalloni. The troops are fighting out hand to hand. It does become a, a big melee where, where you're, you're just trying to use brute force to overwhelm the enemy, to scare them, to, to frighten them, to force them away, and then pursue them. But on the second day, the advantage tilts towards the Romans. The Roman army would emerge hale and healthy at the end of a day and able to fight again, where the other side was reeling from the psychological, emotional, and otherwise effects of the devastation the Romans wreaked on them. In the ensuing slaughter, Toga Dumnus is mortally wounded. Stricken, the survivors vanish into the swamps. The families of the Druid leaders awaken to a new reality. Word of the catastrophe triggers a panic and a scramble to escape. Caraticus and his family must also flee or face humiliation and slavery at the hands of the Romans. 
When the Romans won a significant military victory, the general was traditionally awarded the right to hold what we think of as a ticker tape parade, what they called a triumph. If possible, the leader of the conquered forces was marched throughout the parade to display in his or her person the subjugation of the foreign people. And that, it, traditionally, that person was then executed at the end of the parade as an enemy of the Roman people. Caraticus has no intention of being a Roman trophy. Swearing revenge, he gathers his supporters and leads them on a long journey west to the rugged hill country where the heart of the Druid establishment lies. Caraticus correctly assumes that the Romans will not follow. Instead, they plant themselves on the banks of the Thames. Third century historian Dio. Because of the troubles he had encountered on the Thames, Plautius became afraid. Instead of advancing any further, he proceeded to guard what he had already won and sent for Claudius. But is it really fear that stops Plautius or politics? I doubt a man of experience and ability of Plautius would have been daunted too much by a river like the Thames. It seems more likely to me that he, had, that he was given orders that at a suitable point, once a certain beachhead had been established, once there was a certain hinterland that the Romans could operate in, um, that the emperor be summoned, that he should show up in person to establish that military credibility which he so badly needed. Emperor Claudius attempts to sail to Britannia. His ship is nearly lost off the Spanish coast, and he must march instead through Gaul to Gosoriacum, present-day Boulogne, before finally crossing the channel. It is late in the campaigning season by the time he arrives. We know that the emperor showed up in style. He came with cohorts of his personal bodyguard, the so-called Praetorian Guard, and he also came with elephants. Oh. Which is something, obviously, it's not an animal native to Britain or anywhere in Western Europe, so by showing up with elephants, he was really announcing his presence. And then he supervised, probably from a safe distance in the rear, uh, the uh, capture of various towns and cities. Claudius's surprising arrival, coupled with Caraticus's humiliating defeat, prompts many British warlords to submit rather than fight. We modern people have our own idea of freedom. That's part of our makeup. It's not necessarily the makeup at all of the ancient world. The majority of people simply accustomed themselves to their new leadership. The taxes they were paying to leader A, they would now pay to leader B, and it didn't matter much. If they could cut down on any violence that could be made against them by an army, principally that army not being allowed to rape or pillage or destroy their lands, by acquiescence they would. <laughs> to resist the Romans or collaborate. In the northern kingdom of Brigantes, the decision looms like an ominous shadow. The choice will be made by their powerful queen, Cartamandua. The British were willing to stand up behind women who must have been very powerful personalities, who must have had powerful menfolk that they were attached to, I think, who established their status. Um, and then they must have been able to, by, by dint of force of personality, charisma and so forth, rally their people behind them. The Queen's husband, Venutius, has no doubt about which way the Briganti should go. He opposes the Romans with all his heart. In the area that will become known as Wales, there is no indecision either. Here, Britain's fiercest warlords cleave to the old ways and vehemently reject imperial domination. The Druids call upon their gods to drive the Romans from their shores. In their hour of need, they perform their greatest mystery, the sacrifice of a living man. 
The exile Caraticus becomes their righteous agent. His passion ignites the resistance. He was able to combine some of these very disparate tribes of people into an anti-Roman stance by creating a common enemy. This must have made him the most charismatic British person of the time, because how could he go about and convince so many individuals to oppose a Roman war machine? Bound by common hatred and their ancient religion, the Celts vow to fight on to the bloody end. Victory in battle restores confidence among the Roman rank and file. They no longer fear the British. Little do they know that the worst is yet to come. In 43 AD, Emperor Claudius claims victory in Britannia, even as rebellion takes root on the outskirts of the island. He establishes a Roman province with its capital at Camulodunum, present-day Colchester, where he receives allegiance from a dozen kingdoms. The support of these new allies against the rebels provides a buffer to the fledgling province. After only 16 days in Britain, Claudius returns home. In total, he has been gone just six months. But in terms of status, he is light years away from where he started. He is a conqueror. The propaganda value of such a trip is extraordinary. And it gave him a bump in the political favor of the people in a way that's similar to a, a modern um, president visiting his troops on the line, even if he never goes anywhere near the fighting. Third century historian Dio. The Senate gave him the title of Britannicus. They also voted that there should be an annual festival to commemorate the conquest and that triumphal arches should be erected. The stunning monuments known as triumphal arches stand as much as 70 feet tall. He gets a triumphal arch with an inscription commemorating his achievements in conquering Britain. That's to say a permanent monument in the city of Rome with his name on it that marks Claudius as a great general and a great conqueror. So the military honors are the whole point of the, of the reason to go into Britain. They are, that's the, that's the purpose of it, first and foremost, to give Claudius um, that degree of, uh, as I say, military sort of credibility, military standing that he had formerly lacked. To Plautius, whom the emperor leaves behind as governor of Britannia, the celebration must seem premature. Anytime the Romans step outside their zone of safety, they become targets of well-orchestrated guerrilla attacks inspired by Caraticus, the rebel leader. They would have communicated by means of runners and messengers. And again, knowing the lie of the land, knowing what the quickest ways between the various parts of Britain were, then they would have had an advantage in getting information swiftly between different, different parts of the island. greatest ambushes in history have come from simple logs being rolled down or stones being rolled down onto soldiers below from the mountain above. So here's the Roman. He has his conventional spear. He has his short sword. He's used to close fighting. And suddenly he's having rocks pelted on him. He's having spears thrown at him. He's having axes thrown at him. He's having trees rolled down on him. All of these things take their toll. The British succeeded in outfoxing the Romans because they knew the terrain and that local generals, that is British generals, inspired their troops by giving speeches in which they exhorted them to fight off the invaders who wanted to enslave them, that these were foreigners seeking to conquer them. <laughs>
Caraticus was a very effective at fighting, what, I guess, what we call a guerrilla warfare. The Romans probably called it terrorism or insurgency, um, but he would have called it resistance. And this was fairly effective. Too often the rebels melt away into the forests after an attack. Plautius must crush the resistance or watch it destroy his new province. This meant that the officers on the ground had to make decisions that were not just straight wrote out of whatever training manual that they had been taught from, that they actually had to adapt themselves to the terrain and also to the tactics, we might call guerrilla tactics, of their opponents. In 45 AD, he sends a surge of troops from his headquarters in Camelodinum. Three legions march south, west, and north. The ninth heads for the land of the Brigantes. The courageous Brigantes control the North Country, an important buffer from other barbarians. For the Roman ambassador, the cooperation of Queen Cartamandua is key. You're trying to divide and conquer. You're trying to separate and isolate individual groups, subdue them, and having friends on the, on the home fields uh, uh, is, is a big advantage. Cartamandua accepts the imperial offer. After all, with a legion on her doorstep, her options are limited. What good are you doing for your people if the choice is not between freedom and conquest, but between collaboration or destruction? For somebody like Cartamandua, collaborating with Rome allowed her to remain in a position of authority and to risk a great deal less, perhaps personally, than she might have if she'd tried to fight. Venutius, the queen's consort, vehemently opposes her decision, and he is not alone. It's to the Romans' advantage to have these, arra these arrangements. Now, the problem, of course, is that sometimes as with Cartamandua, you get a split internally where her husband turns against her. Venutius chafes on his short leash, but for now, he suffers the queen's will. Bitter but unbowed, he waits for events to change. The Romans roll across the country, subduing one village after another. The main thing for the Roman governor, particularly in a province that has just been established, is maintaining stability. He has to try to make links with the local community. So any kinds of Romanization, making local people feel comfortable with the Romans there is to, to their advantage. For those who cooperate, the Roman hand is gentle. For those who resist, the vengeance is swift. Soldiers hunt down insurgents and teach them imperial justice at the point of a spear. Every corner turns up troublemakers. But the legionaries find potential converts too. Slowly but surely, they expand Rome's domain, winning hearts and minds as they go. In the arena of Roman politics, General Plautius is a hero. Four years after the invasion, a grateful Claudius calls him home. He brings along his British prisoners for the gladiator ring. Four years is very standard. Uh, for a person to be in command of a province or of an army like that, and then somebody else would come in. You don't want a person to be in command for too long in case the troops become too attached to their commander. And if that happens, they may get ideas that maybe this commander would make a good emperor. Third century historian Dio. In the gladiatorial combats, many persons took part, including the British captives. Plautius used up ever so many men in this part of the spectacle and took pride in the fact. The blood sport of the arena confirms the superiority of every Roman heart. The barbarians are dust beneath their feet. In 47 AD, 
The Romans claim much of the southern part of Britain. Some leaders, like Queen Cartamandua of the Brigantes, come into the imperial fold voluntarily. But many choose to fight, like the rebel prince Caraticus. The work of pacifying a population to the point where Roman armies could be removed from a province was an arduous process. The Romans must have taken a very long-term view to the process of annexation and conquest. They must when facing a charismatic opponent like Caraticus. Caraticus may have had the most uh, significant of these rebellions. He seems to have been able to combine most of the British people and they have successes. The Romanized village is real under Caraticus's audacious attacks. His surprising string of victories makes him first among British chieftains. All look to him to push the invaders from their shores. In November, when he learns that a new Roman governor is assigned to Britannia, Caraticus launches his most virulent assault yet. The new governor, Scapula, receives a bloody welcome to his province. But things do not go as Caraticus predicts. The Roman troops never waver. Scapula deals Caraticus his first major defeat of the insurgency. Still, the rebel leader remains defiant. Caraticus retreats to southern Wales and sparks an uprising there instead. As it spreads north through the hill country, Scapula pulls the 9th Legion out of Brigantes and heads west. All he finds are women and children. The rebels have vanished like smoke into the hills. The Welch Rebellion flourished as almost all rebellions in Wales will flourish down through the early modern period, simply because it's hard to get to the rebels. they have to go into the mountains and the woods and the islands and find where these rebels are and then take them out. It's actually not unlike the situation that American soldiers found themselves in popular histories of Vietnam where the, the Americans found themselves fighting in jungle terrain where the quality of their training elsewhere didn't prepare them for the ability of the enemy to melt into the background. Scapula's solution is to obliterate their hiding places. He destroys every rebel village and presses forward. But behind him, treachery strikes, threatening a second rebellion. In the forest of the Brigantes, the Druids are gathering. The people of the Brigantes see the Romans heading into Wales, which is very difficult territory, and said, well, this is a good opportunity. I mean, when they're busy over there, we can um, cause trouble in the rear and perhaps gain an advantage. Maybe if they're caught between two forces, they'll be destroyed. To make this second rebellion work, one noble is vital, Venutius, husband of the collaborator Queen Cartamandua. Venutius, Cartamandua's husband, of course, was a significant figure. He didn't hold a hereditary position in his own right, but he was perhaps the most highly visible male leader in the kingdom. And as such, his breaking ranks with his wife provided a very significant focus for anybody with aspirations to rebellion. The rebellious nobles discuss Venutius's name and loyalty. Who, after all, would benefit more if his wife, the queen, is overthrown? But they underestimate Cardamandua's reach. She has spies everywhere. When the names of the ringleaders are revealed by her husband's own manservant, she learns that her most valuable warriors are in the plot. Desperate, she turns to Rome. 
client kings and queens, chieftains uh, that, that support the Romans are supporting them because the Romans have worked out some kind of arrangement. In other words, we will come to your aid, and it's kind of an ongoing arrangement. Through the Roman envoy, she sends word to Scapula. He must return to Brigantes immediately and honor Rome's pledge to protect her. The timing couldn't be worse for Scapula. He has no choice but to pull out of Wales and march the 9th Legion back east to support the queen. His departure creates an opening for Caraticus and the Welsh rebels. With the Romans withdrawing, warriors rally to Caraticus from all over Britain. They bring their weapons, ancient beliefs, and their families. This time, the resistance will not hit and run. Caraticus orders his troops to dig in. Classical court historian Tacitus. He selected a site where numerous factors helped him and impeded us, and all defenses were strongly manned. And an entrenched defensive position like that gives a huge advantage to the defender, and he'd every reason to believe, perhaps on this occasion, given these circumstances, that he had chosen the ground and he had prepared the ground, maybe the Romans would falter. I think that Caraticus had a reasonable expectation that he could win. The last chance for British independence hangs on that fragile hope. In the name of the Emperor Claudius, Rome enters the sixth year of the bitter conquest of Britain. The Roman Emperor was imagined and in fact functioned very broadly speaking as commander-in-chief of the Roman Empire. The Emperor was ultimately conceived to be responsible for the success or failure of virtually any enterprise by the Roman state. Continuing chaos in Britain could cast a shadow on Claudius's tenuous hold on the throne. Cartamandua, Rome's client queen in the north, demands that the empire defend her against her rebellious subjects. She and her followers barricade themselves in her stronghold, waiting for Roman general Scapula to rescue her. In short order, Scapula crushes her rebellious subjects and brings her the head of its leader. The royal consort Venutius is outraged. His sympathy for the resistance grows stronger. At last, Scapula marches to Wales with the 9th Legion once more. Desperate to finish off Caraticus, he doubles his troop complement, ordering the 20th Legion out of Camelodunum as well. In 50 AD, with the honor of the Empire weighing on him, Scapula leads thousands of the most highly trained men on Earth against a well-entrenched and determined enemy. It might have been possible for a man like Scapula to persuade Claudius that failure under the particular circumstances would have been acceptable. But basically what was at stake beyond, say, life and death was his chance for a further post after this one. Failure is not an option, but victory will not be easy. Classical biographer Tacitus. Our soldiers reached the rampart, but in an exchange of missiles, they came off worse in wounds and casualties. The Romans simply regroup and come on once more. Rome takes over. Rome becomes Rome the war machine, and there's no future for the rebellion. And that's precisely how history played out. So they really wanted to get to grips with the Britons and finally end this thing. And uh, the vehemence and ferociousness of their assault was such that the Britons were overwhelmed. The luckiest have the good fortune of a quick death. The rest are soon captured. Humiliation, slavery, and ritual murder await the captives. To his horror, Caraticus realizes his wife and children are among them. Caraticus himself escapes. Remarkably, he flees all the way to the kingdom of Brigantes. 
even though their queen, Cartamandua, is a Roman collaborator. Cartamandua's husband, Venutius, is a known patriot and opposed Cartamandua's collaborationist policies with the Romans. I would suggest that Caraticus fled not to Cartamandua, but to Venutius, in the hope of, of uh, perhaps gaining his support, maybe convincing Cartamandua to turn, finally. Cartamandua does not bend. She is Rome's creature. The queen trades Caraticus, the hero of the resistance, to cement her position as a friend of Rome. The betrayal disgusts her husband, Venutius. Paraded through the streets of Rome, Caraticus and his family thrill the citizens. Classical court historian Tacitus. The reputation of Caraticus had spread beyond the islands and through the neighboring provinces to Italy itself. These people were curious to see the man who had defied our power for so many years. Even at Rome, his name meant something. This was the symbol of their victory. You know, here's the enemy chieftain marching uh, through our streets in submission. What normally happened to enemies of Rome was that they were brought into the prison and put into a pit and strangled. But in this instance, it didn't happen. Um, instead, Caraticus was led to Claudius sitting on a large raised sort of a tribunal or dais. Um, and he gave a stirring speech. And if we believe Tacitus, the speech was about the need to resist domination and that if he allows Caraticus to live, that he would be a living symbol of Claudius's clemency. To bestow mercy implies superiority, and above all else, that is how Romans see themselves, as superior. Moved by Caraticus's speech, Claudius grants his celebrity barbarian and all of his family pardon. He was probably retired to a villa somewhere in the neighborhood of Rome where he would have lived out his life in relative comfort, but of course lacking freedom. <laughs> a golden cage. <laughs> the assimilation of Caraticus is at last complete. The Romanization of Britain is not so smooth. Within a decade, the rebels rise again, this time with Venutius at their head. Even a century later, the northern border remains untamable. It never becomes fully Romanized. It's just too far away. And the Romans will eventually, of course, have to build Hadrian's Wall to keep out uh, invaders from the north. It's going to be difficult to hold, and finally they'll abandon it. And frankly, there isn't a lot left of Roman rule in Britain. Conquered to shore up an emperor's reputation, the island drains men and resources for centuries. And when Rome falls at last, Britain will be the first to revert to its barbarian state.